Hi everyone, this is Achuta Baba from Nightlight Astrology. It is Tuesday, March 10th, and today I'm going to show you my new website, which just launched last night, and I'm also going to take you through a chart demo as I preview for you some of the concepts of Hellenistic astrology and also uh, promote my new course, which is coming up in June. So that's what's on the menu for today, um, and I think you're really going to enjoy the chart that I have for you. It's a pretty cool example from my practice, a chart that I got permission to use from one of my clients to show you some really cool concepts. Um, so, all right, but first of all, I'm really excited because it was actually almost two years ago that I started working on a new website. Um, I've always been um, a do-it-yourself kind of person, and I, but admittedly, like my my website looks like <laughs> like it just doesn't look great. So I always wanted to have a more professional looking website. And um, I finally, you know, I hired someone a couple of years ago and then my, um, uh, my second daughter was born. And so that put like a big pause on working on the website with her. And um, then uh, finally, as time allowed, I got around to it. And then it was just a matter of um, getting back on my web developer schedule for launching. So that finally all came together and we scheduled it for Mercury turning direct, which seemed appropriate. And um, anyway, so let me show you it and you can, you can see there's a couple of new features. Um, so here it is. It's nightlightastrology.com. And um, yeah, there's cool stuff. I have an about me page. You can learn a little bit more about me and my story with astrology. Um, my blogs are on the front page, so you can check them out. And then I think just the main thing that I'm really excited about with this course is um, with this um, website, I should say, is how much easier it is to access my courses and my readings. So if you go to the courses tab, you're going to see the first year course, second year course, horary astrology course, all online one year long programs that I offer certification programs. A lot of people take them just because they're interested in astrology, of course, but um, some people take them because they, you know, they really want to become a professional astrologer. Um, the book of reading tab is a lot easier. Um, you'll notice that my horary astrology readings have now become standardized at $60. So that's a change um, that marks the completion of a long phase of apprenticeship for me. And so I'm starting off with a very, uh, I think, reasonable price for my horary readings at $60. So you can check those out under book a reading, um, the horary readings. That's standardized now. The birth chart readings, of course, um, basically the same, but a little a lot easier to book, actually. And then my course is also really easy to sign up and register online. And of course, need-based tuition is still there for people who need it. And we also have all of the... Um, uh, registration forms are online now as well, which is really nice. So in the past, people had to like download PDFs, fill them out, scan them, send them back. So it's all online now, which is nice. Um, you can see the upcoming events page, which is pretty cool. And um, you'll see the recent speaker series we had. This is actually going to be updated a little bit more for the spring speaker series. Um, it'll be even easier to register for my online speaker series. Um, and uh, sign up and receive a link to get the replay if you can't make it live, stuff like that that'll be coming in the next couple of months. Uh, the blog, of course, has, I think I have about 1,500 blogs in here that you can search, keyword search from my previous website. Um, plus, you'll always have the top five or most recent five blogs updated on my homepage, so that's pretty cool. Um, so yeah, and then also um, with my new website comes one really cool addition, which is that you'll see, you know, lots of uh, little spaces for you to sign up for my newsletter. And starting um, probably now, realistically, like later this month, maybe early April, I will be starting to produce exclusive and private video content for those who are interested in learning more about bhakti yoga. There will also be a little bit more um, content regarding the overlap between planets and plants, if you're interested in herbalism and astrology, and a few other things that are be exclusive content only for people who are on my newsletter list. Um, and one of the main reasons I'm doing that for at least for the bhakti yoga content I make is that it's really important when you're sharing, you know, um, spiritual wisdom more directly. It's not, it's more exclusively about yoga and not so much about astrology. I really want people to actually be interested in that. I don't want to be just, you know, putting that out there when people are really primarily coming to hear me talk about astrology. So I always blend the two, as you guys know, who listen to me, but this will be more for people who are like straight up interested in, in bhakti yoga. Um, and then there'll be some really cool overlap between planets and plants. My wife is a clinical herbalist. 
and uh, we'll be doing some work on that together and some other exclusive stuff that you can't, won't be able to get on my normal channel. So if you go to my website, nightlightastrology.com, check out the new, the new spread and sign up for my newsletter, you'll start getting new exclusive content from me later in the month, in addition to all the regular stuff that I make. So, so anyway, that's my new website. Um, I'm so excited. It's, it feels like it's taken a long time to uh, finally get it out there, and it is. I had so many helpful people um, that that helped me, um, you know, make the website. Uh, so a lot of a lot of help went into it. Um, I will be probably doing at some point um, a an interview or a talk with the web developer because she has some really good tips for do-it-yourself websites um, that she teaches people, and it can be a really nice way if you can't afford to hire someone to do a website for you, especially if you're an astrologer, a budding astrologer, and you want to put your website out there. She has some really good tips that helped me in the beginning, and then I ended up hiring her to do my whole website, um, which was you know one of the best investments easily of my professional career. And I don't like putting a lot of money into things like marketing or advertising, but she was really helpful. Um, and then um, I had a really amazing uh, copywriter, a friend of a friend who is a copywriter who helped me with the text for the website. Um, I had someone who helped me rebrand my logo, like just little things that you can't get done without having a network of people to plug you in and be like, here, I have a friend who does this, or I have a friend who does that. And um, I just, I was just really fortunate to have some really creative people help me kind of reconceptualize my website. So anyway, uh, so check that out. And, um, and then now the other thing that I wanted to mention is uh, I have, um, I, yesterday, in yesterday's newsletter, and probably again in today's newsletter, you'll see it, um, I introduced my social media manager, Kat. She is someone who helps me produce, edit, distribute, <clears throat> and make more professional looking all of my social media content. She's really a nice person who just um, uh, helps me here and there. Really, um, really awesome to have her. And I introduced her in yesterday's newsletter. And um, she has a really cool podcast called The Creative Introvert. And um, I've been on her show before. She specializes in talking to creative introverts about their creative process. Really think she's awesome. And then... Um, Delia Galagos, who is my new personal assistant, all of that help that I have uh, just took my work week from like for about 10 years, I've been a 60 to 70 hour work week kind of guy. Not a lot of people uh, know that about me, but I, I've worked on exclusively astrology basically for 10 years at, at that kind of rate. And it's been, you know, it's it, with kids and a family, it's been really um, getting to be too much. Um, and so this recent, the success of the recent Kickstarter, which you all helped me with, um, actually has provided me the ability to have a few people helping me out sort of here and there with things. Um, Delia is one of them who's going to be handling my emails and scheduling and things like that. Um, and what that allows me to do is focus more on content creation. It helps me to focus more on developing curriculum, on working with clients, on the things that I do um, really, you know, that I do best. And also is going to help me hopefully in the next year to begin the um, drafting, creative drafting process of a new book. So I wrote my first book in 2010. It was called Fishers of Men, the Gospel of an Ayahuasca Vision Quest. Uh, it was published by Tarcher Penguin in 2010. You can still, there's a Kindle version of it online and you can maybe get a, um, a used copy of the hard, hardback somewhere. But anyway, it's been a long time of um, gradually developing my knowledge and practice of astrology and really wanting to cultivate that before writing anything about astrology. And so I had a very um, special teacher in my life tell me, you know, really give yourself some time before you write a book about astrology, even though I had people saying, well, look, you wrote one book, it'd you know, be easy to publish another, you have some public platform about astrology, you know, people know you as an astrologer. So you should write a book about astrology. But I've really held off for a long time, because it's been really important for me to feel like I, I really have um, something authentic to speak from in terms of experience and study and time under my belt, so to speak. But now that I have a little bit more help, um, thanks to all of you, um, that's actually possible. So I'm going to probably in the next year, um, uh, as, as the universe allows or not, uh, to start um, drafting the content for a new book. So anyway, I wanted to share all of that with you because none of this would have been possible if it weren't for your support over the past, what, six or seven years. I've been doing my Kickstarter every year. And the past couple of years, 
the support has been generous enough to to the point where you know I've been able to have a little bit of extra help. My work week is going down to more like forty to fifty hours from sixty to seventy, which is amazing. And um, yeah, I'm able to spend a little bit more time with my family and start doing things that are you know take my cr- the creative um, uh, depth of the content forward um, even more. And so. At the end of the day, I hope that that benefits all of you and uh, serves you in your spiritual life. And um, yeah, I'm just feeling really humbled and blessed for your help and support. So go check it out, see all the the cool stuff. And uh, if you sign up for a newsletter, you can meet the people who are helping me um, and stuff like that. Now today, as promised, I want to talk a little bit about, I'm going to show you some techniques and concepts from a natal reading that I recently did that I received permission to share with you from my client, um, which is really nice. I'm also going to be putting out a survey uh, probably in the next couple of months for those of you who would like to participate in um, some of the research that I'm gathering for my classes, my curriculum, my online presentations. Um, Basically, I'll be asking some questions about some of the most, um, you know, painful but educational experiences in your life as well as some of the you know subjectively difficult and easier or beneficial areas of your life where things have gone really well where things have been really difficult and um, specific stories and things like that in order to illustrate concepts from astrology so um, I will be sending that out probably in the next couple of months to gather research and I'd love for you guys to participate in that it's always nice when someone volunteers to let me use um, you know, uh, a chart after I've heard their story and stuff like that. Um, but at any rate, um, this chart that I'm going to show you today illustrates a number of different concepts that we use in Hellenistic astrology. And before I show you them, what I want to preface this with is that around this time of year, I will start, um, you know, promoting my upcoming courses. And as I do that, what I try to do is show you what Hellenistic astrology is, why it's useful, how it differs in some regards from modern astrology, um, and then some specific techniques to just kind of uh, whet your appetite for learning more and also to um, just illustrate some of the ways in which learning Hellenistic astrology is, is so important. So for those of you who don't know, Hellenistic astrology is the form of astrology that Um, is at the roots of our horoscopic astrological tradition. It is the astrology that was practiced in the Greco-Roman era of astrology a couple thousand years ago and um, shares a lot in common with ancient Indian astrology. Um, So some of the features that, you know, of of ancient Hellenistic astrology are that we use as whole sign houses, use as whole sign aspects uh, and degree-based aspects. Uh, uses the traditional seven planets, not asteroids and outer planets. Um, there's very um, uh, interesting use of fixed stars and what are called the hermetic lots. Lots of other technical concepts. What is the main um, distinction between modern and ancient astrology? In modern astrology, the chart is really viewed as the self, and the chart is used in order to understand oneself, which is great. It's sometimes called psychological astrology. However, one of the things, the downsides of psychological astrology, you could say, is that um, it, it promotes, in a sense, um, a f- identification with the birth chart, and it can also promote something of an unhealthy preoccupation with ourselves, like a kind of navel gazing. Um, ancient astrology, when put together with modern psychological astrology, I believe kind of balances that tendency out. Why? Because ancient astrology's bread and butter is predictive. You know, it's like you're, you're, um, when you sit down with a chart in, in the Hellenistic mode of reading, what you're doing is you're um, gaining insight into the person's life um, by means of more concrete predictions. And the chart is not really seen as you. The chart is seen as your karma and your fate or your destiny. And so to understand that is not the same thing in ancient astrology as understanding yourself and your inner workings and psychology and character. It can go along with that kind of use of the chart, but in some ways what we're really trying to do is say, look, you know, who you are as a spirit soul is a mystery. Who you are is unfathomably deep. Who you are is love, beauty, eternity, knowledge, bliss, goodness, truth. That's who you are. Who you are in relation to the stuff that happens to you is so much about how you use your free will to live a spiritually meaningful and reflective life in relation to the things that happen to you that are a part of your karmic path or your destiny that are caused from previous choices and past lives, 
as well as um, that are caused that are being caused by choices in this life. So the birth chart in ancient astrology is a bit more like a snapshot of the parameters or field of karma that you're born into, the momentum from which comes from past lives. And we don't look at it as much as that's who you are. We look at it as that's what you're going to do or that's what's going to happen in different areas. And who you are is about the kind of spiritual life you live in relation to it. And so in some ways, again, ancient astrology is going to pull that sense of self out of the chart a little bit more, whereas modern astrology is going to say this chart tells you who you are. Now, both can be really useful tools. So it's not really that one is better than the other. There's pros and cons of both approaches depend, depending on how they're used and whose hands you're in as, you know, with, your, with a reader. But uh, at any rate, I'm going to illustrate now a couple of concepts from the chart that we have today, um, which I'm, again, just really grateful to have in front of us. So let me see if I can pull it up now. So in this chart, I'm going to show you sort of what happens in a Hellenistic style of reading. And if I can uh, put this into slide mode. Here we go. Okay, let's see here. Okay, there we go. So in this reading, um, I was reading for a young woman and we were looking at um, we're looking at her birth chart and the approach that I was taking in the beginning of the chart uh, reading, excuse me, in the beginning of the reading was to uh, just take a look at some of the most dynamic um, faded events or themes that are present in the chart. Why? Because these are the themes that were, you know, each person in their chart uh, it, going to have certain themes that we contend with. Contend with meaning we struggle to define ourselves in relation to these plot lines or these events or these people or these places. And so whenever I look at a chart in Hellenistic astrology, what we're doing is we're kind of, what we're doing is we're kind of looking at which planets stand out. For example, in ancient astrology, when you're born during a daytime chart versus a nighttime chart, certain planets will be in power and will take on more importance or will have a stronger voice in the chart. For example, in this chart, this client was born during the daytime when the sun was out. And so the sun becomes what we call the sect light, the leader of the chart. Here it is in the ninth house, which was actually traditionally called the joy of the sun. The ninth house is related to things like religion and spirituality or mysticism, as well as theology, philosophy, um, our beliefs. The ninth house is related to foreign countries or pilgrimage. The ninth house is related to the law and the search for truth. Uh, the ninth house is also related to the search for higher meaning or the higher mind. So these are all things that have been associated with the ninth house for thousands of years. And the ninth house was called, it was called God. That was the name of the house. And it was also called the joy of the sun. And so when the sun is in this house, it's a naturally comfortable place for the sun. However, in this chart, one of the things that we see is something uh, pretty difficult actually in, in this specific chart. And that is a, malefic enclosure. So the sun is, you can see its ray at 1621 casts uh, right in between Saturn and Mars, or you could go the opposite way and say that Saturn's ray falls behind the sun, uh, whereas Mars's ray falls ahead of the sun. So either way, uh, let me just make this a little cleaner so you can see it. The sun is sitting right between its degree marker is sitting right between Saturn and Mars's degree markers, the two malefic planets, meaning these planets, their significations tend to be more difficult. Mars is the god of war. Saturn is the god of winter and death. So these, these planets, uh, while they can be deeply meaningful, depending on how we relate to them and the events or themes that they signify, generally indicate things that are more difficult. Um, of course, a lot depends on the context in the chart, the house, the sign, aspects, and so forth. But here we see the sun in the ninth, uh, sandwiched between the malefics who are in the twelfth house. We also know that the twelfth house, called um, uh, Malas Daemon, evil spirit in ancient astrology, is a very difficult house. It was the joy of Saturn. Well, here you have an exalted Saturn in Libra, uh, who is also in its joy in the twelfth house, just like the sun is in the ninth. But you have Mars in its exile. Uh, in Libra, the natural sign that is opposite to Mars's home sign of Aries, which means Mars is a little debilitated. 
Uh, it's also a daytime chart, and Mars is called the malefic contrary to the sect in favor in a daytime chart, which means Mars is more difficult by daytime, thought to become kind of excessively hot and fiery. So for that reason, we have a really difficult situation for the sun. And not entirely bad. Saturn's pretty well dignified here, but Mars is not doing so well. And in, in either case, when, the, when any planet is sort of sandwiched between the, the bodies of the malefics, um, there, there's, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a world of hurt. <laughs> I think that's generally what it will signify is something really difficult. So what would it signify that would be difficult? Well, it's going to be relative to the sun. The sun wants to signify a life that is lived in service to or uh, in relation to the themes of the ninth house. So this is a person who's going to be motivated by higher education, by teaching, by traveling abroad, by uh, religion or spirituality, by the law and the search for truth. These are very simple things that a ninth house sun will indicate as the kind of narrative arc of a life. So we started off there saying, look, these themes are going to be really important. Uh, however, there's going to be some really difficult things that come up along the way. For example, there could be some deep sense of disillusionment, pain, loss, or suffering that comes as the result of um, a, a religious path. For example, you could become disillusioned by a religious path, or there could be some kind of controversy or scandal related to a religious path. Why am I saying that? Because the sun in the ninth house will represent a religious path, among other things. And then the malefic enclosure in the 12th might signify some kind of scandal, loss, pain, or difficulty associated with it, especially the potential for something that is legal or moral or ethical because Saturn and Mars in Libra in the 12th house, the sign of the balance, and uh, is related with justice. And so uh, consequences and uh, you know, could a crime and punishment, these are Libra themes, especially Saturn in Libra themes. So we started off saying that. We also said there could be, you know, this same themes of difficulty, loss, scandal, corruption, um, challenge, et cetera, could be present in relation to higher education. You could have some kind of, you know, getting kicked out of school or something like that. Um, and so we kind of started off building this story about the ninth house sun and its importance, as well as the potential for some uh, scandal or hardship or difficulty relative to that path in life to emerge. We also added that because the sun represents the father, the natural signifier of the father, that this could also involve one's father or that one's father could, you know, um, be involved in the um, depiction of the difficulties that we're describing. And if not father, we know because the sun is in cancer and the moon is, whoops, the moon is also in the fourth house. So here you see the sun and cancer in the ninth, it's ruler, the moon in the fourth house of home and family, that uh, this difficulty that the sun is running into between Saturn and Mars in the 12th could also relate back to home, family, and roots. It's in the moon sign and the moon is, all, is back in the fourth house, which is also associated with themes of home and family. So indeed, um, this person, so this is me not knowing this person from anyone, right? And again, when it's with, with Hellenistic astrology, what I'm sitting down to do is to talk about the destined events and themes of life from a more predictive and concrete point of view. Um, I'm describing one's karma and I'm describing the fated events that you'll meet on the road. And so in this individual's case, um, indeed, they grew up in a religious home with a father who was um, a somewhat well-known figure in a religious um, organization who ended up um, facing some uh, legal problems within that organization that were very serious and were a part of um, this individual's, um, I don't want to say that they lost their faith because it turns out they're still a spiritual person on a spiritual path, but it was a deep challenge and test that created some trauma and there was real loss around it. And this scandal, so to speak, also um, ended up having some devastating effects on her family. The second thing that she was able to confirm was that when she was in high school, uh, when this person was uh, in high school, she also lived and survived through one of the more famous um, mass shootings in American history. So, you know, there's been some big ones, and I'm not going to say which one. She asked me to keep that private, but um, she was present in school and um, uh, 
there when one of the more um, notable mass shootings in American history happened in her high school. So those all, and those happened, those were happening at the same time, back to back, the thing with the uh, religious organization and the scandal and her father, and then right after that, the mass shooting at her high school. So now when we use, again, so that was just remarkable. And again, thank you to uh, my client for letting me share this with you because it's, um, you know, it's a remarkable, it's a remarkable story. And when you're sitting with an astrologer, what is the benefit of knowing this, right? You know, one could easily ask that question. The benefit is that when we have our karma described for us, <clears throat> for example, I, um, you know, I had another client yesterday who six months ago when I was in, when she was in for a reading, I said, it looks like your husband's health is going to take, um, you know, may, may take, um, there may be some difficulties associated with your husband's health coming up in the next few months. So her husband ended up getting, um, being diagnosed with um, Bell's palsy or something. I don't remember what it was. It was one thing or another. And um, <clears throat> that was really, really difficult. And um, so, you know, when she came back for a reading, her, um, her, her motivation for having a reading was, hey, um, that was really accurate. And I feel like I, if it's going to rain, I want to know so I can bring an umbrella. And that's really what ancient astrology is better at. It's more predictive. It, you know, I like to say, you know, people are always like in, mo in modern astrology, a lot of times people are like, I'm not a fortune teller. Look, I'm not a fortune teller. I'm just here to like, you know, help you understand yourself. Well, ancient astrologies were fortune tellers. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like ancient astrologers were, ancient astrology was more about fortune telling in this regard, but not fortune telling in the sense of like, you know, being, being cheap and tricking people or whatever, you know, some of that image of like the trickster or huckster or something like that. And I all respects the fortune tellers because, um, you know, it, 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 it's a different level of study. It's a different level of commitment to learn the theories and techniques. It's a bit more learning act like acupuncture or like herbal medicine, or it's more systematic. It's more scientific. The theories are more, um, fine-tuned, I guess you could say, and more technically sophisticated. Um, and in order to use them to predict things, there's a lot of things that we have to learn so that we are in really in service and caring for our clients because you can scare people, you can, you know, it's possible to do harm once you get into this level of stuff. You can, if you get it wrong, you know, you can really freak people out too. So the art of predictive astrology is something that we take a lot of time to cover and work through very carefully and thoughtfully in my courses. But <laughs> needless to say, when you do have this kind of information in front of you, um, what it does for people <clears throat> are two things. One, it just helps us to live our lives with equanimity in the face of all of the trials and hardships that we deal with. At the same time, it can also be really nice to know, hey, you know, money is going to be a little bit better this year or, you know, <clears throat> You might get that job or you might be going back to school or it looks like you're doing some really fun traveling or you might be getting pregnant or married or, you know, there's lots of things that are very joyous as well. So on the one hand, it's just ancient astrologers believed that it was helpful to know something about your fate, to know something about your destiny, because so many times we lose our center. We lose our sense of the inner spirit soul being the source of our happiness when we attach too much importance to the ups and downs of life, when we see that so many of those things are actually, um, you know, determined as early as the moment that we're born due to our past karma, um, it becomes easier to ride with them, to ride the ups and downs, to find the deeper meaning and message and teachings in them. Um, you know, when we're prepared a little bit and we know what's coming. In retrospect, this individual found it incredibly useful to hear that indeed, although this was some time ago when she was a teenager, that these events were there from the time she was born and that I could sit down and just see them. So it helps us to knowing these things helps us to stay centered in the ups and the downs. And by the way, people need to stay centered in the ups as much as the downs because ups are followed by downs. And if we get diluted by the ups, <clears throat> thinking that they'll last forever, we can be so deeply disappointed when another rough patch comes. So astrology is really like karmic, karmic weather in, in the ancient world. And it's not seen as a bad thing. In modern astrology, sometimes people are like, you know, you know, how, 
what if you what if you're saying this is making it happen and ancient astrologers are like yeah you're not that powerful sorry to burst your bubble <laughs> you know it's like no no you can't i mean maybe there's some there's definitely a level at which we the power of suggestion is real and strong but not when it comes to like you know shaping the events that happened in your high school when you were 13 mass shooting or you know your scandal with a parent or things like that so um at any rate uh the psychological level of astrology is really where we have to be more careful about the power of suggestion because when we tell people this is who you are this is how you are then they'll start acting and behaving like that and really we could all use a huge dose of not thinking of ourselves as zodiac signs but thinking of ourselves as eternally unfolding mysterious beautiful souls um, who find our meaning and the depth and come to know ourselves more and more and more in the way that we relate to all of these things not in the way that we identify with them so ancient astrology definitely helps us with that the second thing that ancient astrology helps us with and why it's so good to study if you're a fan of astrology is that it starts seeding something in the heart that's really powerful uh, which I, is always going to be sound a little bit redundant because I've already sort of implied this, but by seeing that I am not these material results, I am not the events that unfold one after another in the timeline of my life, that I am the one experiencing them, that I am the observer, the witness, the experiencer, the soul is the mediating middle ground through which all of these experiences flow, the good and the bad. What I'm really here to do is to let bring that out to develop and awaken that inner dwelling self uh, and connect it back to my source astrology helps us do that by reinforcing over and over again over a long period of time don't invest your sense of happiness or your sense of control as much in these material circumstances and outcomes you know sort of you're going to do life life is going to happen you're going to participate in it you can't help but participate in it because the material energy is like a mighty river and you're in it and you're not getting out of it. You're being pulled along by it. You have some degree of control over it, but very small compared to what most people think they do, especially people who speak about prosperity gospels and create your own reality and stuff like that. Um, that I'm not, not to poo poo the degree to which conscious intentionality is important, but people nowadays place way too much emphasis on how in control we should be or are in a sort of gospel of empowerment. Ancient astrology is more about realizing that your control lies within your consciousness, within the way that you experience, within the quality of what you experience, um, not so much in controlling the externals. The externals are more like the features of a wildly complex ecology of the universe. And the chart is helping us see the moving energies of that system in symbolic terminology and when we see the way our, our birth chart is giving us a picture of how our life is shaped according to that field having that knowledge again over time what it does is it works on you and it helps you realize i am not these things i am this is not who i am not that you can't stand in loving relationship to all of it you don't have to reject it or renounce it either you don't have to condemn any of it but it's significant to say, look, I'm not the happiness of my job. I'm not the success of my bank account. I'm not the, the, the weight or I'm not the, you know, the success of a marriage or I'm not the success of parenting. We try hard to do our best in all of these areas. But, you know, come, come uh, you know, at some point in our life, there comes times that are really rough and there comes times that are really good. So over time, astrology is helping us to realize, no, you're, you're the indwelling soul. Um, and that's really the deeper esoteric purpose of astrology. And you hear ancient astrologers talking about this unanimously. I mean, they all talk about this. So uh, and that's certainly the point of astrology as a part of the yoga uh, philosophy in India as well, that uh, dovetails and goes right along with the history of Western astrology. So that's why we describe karma like this. Now, let me show you something else that was kind of cool about this chart. The other thing that we can see is in a chart like this, we're going to look for well-dignified planets. And by the way, this person also had a career in teaching, uh, sun in the ninth house. So um, you can see that um, Mercury and Venus are in the eighth house. The lot of fortune is also in the eighth house, right there, that little circle with an X through it. Mercury is in its own domicile, and that means that Mercury is very strong. In a daytime chart, Mercury is also happening to be the morning star here and um, was basically uh, in the, here, I'll just show you. <clears throat> so um, 
Yeah, so Mercury's in the morning star position here. You can see it because if you were to back this up, back the sun up to the ascendant, you see Mercury would have risen before the sun over here. So that means that Mercury is the morning star. So it's a morning star playing for the daytime team of planets. It's in its own domicile and it's with benefic Venus and a lot of fortune in the eighth house. So another thing that I said was you can notice that Venus also has a trine to these planets in the 12th. And I said, one of the things that could become a saving grace for you, despite the hardships that you might experience through education, religion, et cetera, um, will be the relationships you have and the resources that they provide you with. And sure enough, there was a story in this individual's life of not only um, marrying people who had wealth, money, property, and things like that, that were able to be of real support to this person um, and ended up kind of providing them with a form of support that helped them to find their path and recover a little bit from some of the trauma that they had experienced in their teenage years. But also um, this spoke to the pattern throughout their life of being in relationships with people who, um, where there were there was financial support that was given to this individual, and some of that financial support was there to help them do um, artwork as well, which is Venusian. So anyway, this eighth house theme became really important in their life as well, which was marrying into wealth and support in that respect, and then also um, uh, receiving things like grants and help uh, from other people in order to pursue artwork. So that was a subjectively positive area of the chart that we looked at that ended up having a huge impact on their life as well. Ancient, again, ancient astrology can just zone right in and go, this topic, this theme uh, will be supportive. This theme will feel subjectively positive. This one may feel a little bit negative. You're trying to do this, but this will be challenging, right? So that's the general outline. Anyway, there's a lot more that could be said about this chart, but I just wanted to show you some examples that I thought you might find interesting. Um, my new class starts um, in, let's see, hold on, I'm going to pull it up on my website so you can actually see it again on my website. So I'm so excited about this. Okay, so here is the certification course tab. If you go to my courses tab, first year astrology certification course called Ancient Astrology for the Modern Mystic. All of your questions about the course should be answered here. You'll get to see everything that's covered in the course. It's a one-year course that includes 30 online webinar classes, 12 online webinar classes outside of those 30 led by guest teachers. There's 42 classes on the year. There's bonus lectures, uh, webinar discussions, interactive group forum discussions, reading and quizzes, um, all optional stuff that you can do to take it sort of as far as you want. Everything's recorded and archived for you in an online folder. All classes are live in webinar. You can email me year round with questions. There's a certification course at the end that's optional if you want to take it. Um, the next class begins on June 14th. Uh, and you can see that there are three ways of making payment. There is a one-time payment of $12.99, and that is uh, savings of over $500. Um, that's the sort of early bird rate. You have to pay that sometime before the start of class uh, in one lump sum. You do 12 monthly payments. If you can't afford to take the class because you know, you will only work part-time, you're a single parent, you're on disability, you're retired and on a fixed budget. If you have some kind of financial crisis you're facing, I also do offer need-based tuition, which you can find more information about there as well. So I, I love studying astrology. I love teaching astrology. Um, it's an amazing thing. If, you're, if you love astrology and you're feeling like, I really want to get really grounded and um, you know, really understand what I'm talking about and be able to read very accurate information in a person's birth chart, but you're also wanting to, you know, be able to tell people about their character, their behavior, their psychology, have a little fun with that stuff. That's why I call my course Ancient Astrology for the Modern Mystic, because it's really a crossover between the two. So I hope to see you all in class. I hope you enjoyed this demo today. Thank you again to my client for allowing me to share little pieces of our session. Um, it was a great, you know, it was a great session. We got to talk about a lot of things. And like I said, most people find that being able to have some really accurate, specific information about your karma is really, really helpful. It prepares you in your heart um, to be your best person, regardless of what's coming. So thank you guys for listening. Hope you'll check out the website and have a great rest of your week. Take care. Bye.